This is what a solar farm looks like. And this is what it sounds like. This is Mingi Solar Farm in Will Burton in Cambridgeshire. It generates 5 megawatts, enough to power 1,500 homes. And while it's doing all that work, you wouldn't know there was a 30-acre solar farm here even if you were stood only a few metres away from it. As opposed to some other forms of energy, which prize financial gain above the ecology, here in the UK, we have very strict planning guidelines in place for finding the right site for a solar farm, ensuring both a homegrown source of energy and a natural landscape to go with it. I met Simon Stonehouse from Natural England to talk through some of the ways in which solar farms can be installed responsibly. It's about the effectiveness of the measures that you can deliver on that site. Um, so in, in sort of biodiversity terms, it could be about sort of habitat creation sort of um, in around the site. Um, in, in landscape terms, it could be about screening and that kind of thing um, to sort of reduce, reduce visual impacts. Solar farm developers agree to avoid grade one and two land where possible and conduct surveys to confirm the quality of the land being developed. On top of this, they offer significant local visual mitigation measures such as tree screening and hedgerows so that with the appropriate topography, the area of visual influence could be zero. But it doesn't stop there. More and more farmers are encouraging biodiversity amongst the panels. Dual land usage means that a field could contain a solar array, but at the same time encourage wildlife to live around it. Sheep can graze on the grass, bees can feed here, even wild birds can nest around the panels. This is Guy Parker, who performs independent surveys of solar farms to make sure developers and owners are doing as much as they can to aid biodiversity. He took some time to explain some of the potential ecological benefits of solar farms. Solar parks actually have a huge potential to deliver for, for, for wildlife. Uh, and I have to say, I was fairly skeptical when I started um, working alongside solar. I couldn't, didn't necessarily see there was a huge um, benefit for wildlife. But uh, there's, there's actually a great potential in a solar park because you tend to be dealing in fairly low-grade agricultural land to begin with. Uh, so there's room for improvement for wildlife. There's south-facing grassy slopes, which are very good for flowers and, and insects. And these sites are in place for 25 odd years, which is a good long time for, for good land management practices to really bite and to really start showing improvements for wildlife. So all those things I think are, are stacked in favor of solar parks. Whatever developers do decide to do, it, it really does have to kind of fit in with the primary purpose of this site, which of course is clean power generation. And what I'm hoping we're seeing is that more and more developers are taking up the challenge and uh, starting to put these kind of um, land management activities in place. So we've learned that there are a lot of protocols in place to ensure that a solar farm is doing as little as possible to disrupt both the landscape and the use of the land itself. But what about the end of a project's lifetime? At the end of 25 years, uh, in a well-written lease agreement, uh, there will be an option for the farmer to have all of the equipment removed from the land um, and uh, you know, any concrete pads, um, housing uh, transformers or something of the sort, uh, removed down to a, a reasonable depth uh, so that the land can all be put back to its previous agricultural purpose. Um, that land will rather be like uh, the former set-aside scheme. It will be land which has been rested for a period of years, um, but it will be maintained in good agricultural and environmental condition and will be suitable for putting straight back to its previous use, whether it was a pasture or whether perhaps it was an arable field. This land could go back into production 25 years' time. With, um, with, with the AD plant, you're growing maize. You don't need planning permission for maize, but solar is actually 34 times more efficient. There's sort of no question there, really. And we are preserving the land. Rather than degrading it, it's actually been preserved. This land, it's not, it's not very good growing land, but in 25 years' time, it's going to be a lot better than it is at the moment. There are a lot of factors to consider when thinking about maintaining power levels in the UK. How do we create clean, renewable energy to reduce our carbon emissions and provide for our future? How do we use the land we have to build sustainable sources of electricity? And how do we do this while safeguarding both the ecology of our rural countryside and our view? Perhaps the answer to all these questions is right here. Sunlight is by far and away the most abundant carbon-free energy source. 
Solar power is the only renewable resource that has enough terrestrial energy potential to satisfy, actually to exceed, the necessary carbon-free energy. No other sustainable energy source comes close.